Welcome to Reinvent Healthcare, the podcast for health and wellness practitioners who are passionate about making a difference. Today, we have the pleasure and the honor of speaking with Dr. Allison Grimston. She's a medical doctor trained in women's health. She's in general practice and functional medicine. Dr. Allie has a passion for helping women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s to take back ownership of their health and hormones. I am super excited to have known her for the last eight or nine years and watched her and her passion and how much she offers to people. She has over 20 years of experience in various um, women's health issues. She helps women to connect deeply to their bodies. And that's something that a lot of us women don't do on a regular basis. And whether you're in menopause, thyroid, insulin resistance, or adrenal issues, she helps them so they can dance with the aging process instead of being collapsed by it and no longer feel that their health has them down. So Dr. Ali, I'm so excited to have you here. Thanks very much, Dr. Regan Marie. I'm honored and excited to be on this podcast. I love Reinvent Healthcare. I'm so glad that you're here and I'm so glad that you like the podcast. So I want to just jump right in and talk a little bit about, you know, I know that you got into women's health and there were some backgrounds. So give us a little background on what made you passionate about working with people in menopause. Right. Well, uh, my story probably starts when I was 17 and I was involved in a car accident and broke my back in two places. So that was just before I started medical school. And so I started medical school. I didn't take a year out like I should have done, you know, and uh, I just started medical school with chronic pain. And I learned the hard way that uh, medicine, the way it's taught, isn't the answer to chronic health challenges. And I had chronic pain and I had to use a lot of alternatives to support me. It wasn't just a case of relying on physiotherapy and painkillers. Uh, I was living on painkillers. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they helped me survive. I used a TENS machine. I used acupuncture. Has it had those things? And that's what brought me around to having a holistic approach to health and really being passionate about a more, a, a more grounded and whole person approach to health and well-being. And then when I was at medical school, I just loved yeah. endocrinology and gynecology. That combination was, was just what floated my boat. Yeah. Well, we're glad that that focuses you because here's the thing. I, I know that so many people who are, you know, whatever you want to call them, functional medicine doctors or doctors that are bioidentical hormone doctors, whatever, those people are very into testing the sex hormones and then trying to help people with prescriptions, with bioidenticals or even herbs. But I think they're missing some stuff. And what I love about your approach is that you look at what's the deeper cause of those medical, those menopausal symptoms. Why do some women have menopausal symptoms uh, and other women sail through menopause, right? What is the difference between those folks and how do we, um, you know, how do we look for that deeper cause? I know you look at the emotional factors and we, you look at the, the diet, you look at the, the other hormones. So I would love to hear a little bit more about your approach with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I spent 12 years working in an incontinence and prolapse clinic. So that was another element of why I absolutely, um, am passionate about helping women to prevent this from happening. Um, because it's not necessary, but my own experience of perimenopause was through burnout. And I feel that was the start of perimenopause for me. And, um, and fundamentally it's, it's not just about slapping some hormones on top. We need to find what the root cause is of the dysfunction. And the, the, when we're in our forties as women, there are so many hormonal dysfunctions that are impacting us, including yeah. the, the big, big impact of the stress that we're under. And especially nowadays where we are running a family, we've got a career or an entrepreneurial business. Uh, we have so many things involved in that. And there's a lot, uh, 
there's a lot carried by women in today's world and we tend to have perfectionist or at least I certainly had perfectionist workaholic tendencies I went into general practice in the end because my back my broken back wasn't strong enough for me to do gynecology as I wanted to and um, mm. I wanted to be as good as the as the men I wanted to be full-time I wanted to be as good as the men despite having a broken back and having a family however when you fa have a family your priorities change and the cumulative stress of trying to be all things to all people has its toll. Uh, and really, we need to be addressing this at the grassroots level. But even more than that, um, what's so amazing is finding out and, and learning through the Institute for Nutritional Endocrinology and finding out through research how how we are doing patients a disservice in the usual medical approaches where we are just using pharmaceutical HRT, which is um, which is you know it it has some damaging effects as well. But you know it, we're lucky to have what we have. But really, we just need to be looking taking a much broader look for example the gut health is crucial to menopause and menopause symptoms and to thyroid and thyroid symptoms and this is where um ignoring gut health not even asking questions about how gut health is 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 it's stopping women from getting well fundamentally yeah yeah yeah, and you know, it's really important to look at that. And I love that your approach because I know that, you know, when you do like your menopause relief program, you don't just take people through, okay, let's just test your hormones. Oh, these are out of balance. Here's what you need to take. Or, oh, you know, we can take some hormones and we can add some herbs. You look at, and, and I know you have that pause and, and you know, sleep, re stress reduction, all of those things are important. And most doctors, even functional medicine doctors oftentimes, don't pay attention to that. And then women tend to go through menopause with, oh, they're, they're miserable, right? They just can't get rid of the hot flashes and the sleepless nights and the irritability and their relationships suffer when if we really look deeper. So one of the questions, and I just wanted to stay because you reminded me, Dr. Allie, the way I know Dr. Allie, she's been, she's a graduate of our nutritional endocrinology practitioner training. And, you know, what I love is that, you know, we have medical doctors and nurses and all kinds of people in there. And um, we also have health coaches in there. And so what I love about the medical doctors that we attract is they're people that are looking at going, I wasn't taught everything in medical school that I actually need to help people get well long term. And then they come and they learn, you know, the endocrinology and how the nutrition plays a, a role. And I think that that's such an important piece of helping women with menopause. Uh, but, but since we're talking thyroid in this series, I really want to shift to, you know, how does thyroid hormone balance play into menopause symptoms? And how does menopause and the shifts in hormones play into thyroid symptoms? It's really interesting. And so many women get diagnosed as having menopause when the issue is thyroid or diagnosed as thyroid when the issue is menopause. But in actual fact, in most cases, it's a combination. I read, just as I rarely see a woman in perimenopause who doesn't have adrenal insufficiency in issues, there, there is insufficiency and dysfunction in the entire hypothalamic pituitary adrenal thyroid axis. And so this, the whole axis is set wrong. And there are so many elements of perimenopause that impact that. For example, we know that the, if you have estrogen dominance, which is really common in perimenopause, in, in our countries, we get episodes where we have the estrogen have being excessive, the progesterone being depleted. Even when the estrogen is depleted, it's often depleted less than the progesterone. So we have this state of estrogen dominance which is partly related to the uh, Zen estrogens in the environment. Uh, but there are other reasons as well. And stress is one of those. When we have this estrogen dominance state, that then can impact our, um, our, the way our thyroid can, can um, 
can function. For example, when you have progesterone deficiency, you get a down regulation of thyroid peroxidase antibody. When you get, uh, sorry, thyroid peroxidase, when you have elevated estrogen, you get an increase in thyroid binding globulin activity, which then leads to decreased free T3 and T4. And you need to bear that in mind when women are on artificial estrogen as well, whether it's the combined pill, whether it's due to mm -hmm. HRT or bioidentical hormone therapy. And therefore, treating someone's menopause with hormone replacement therapy can then impact their thyroid function. And if they're already underactive, that can impact it. Yeah. And we know, you know, you mentioned stress. We know the interaction between cortisol and thyroid function, right? So, so it's super important that you get that stress under control. And when women are going through menopause, they tend to be way more stressed out than they would be at another time because they're concerned about their hormones changing. They're concerned that they can't sleep, concerned about the irritability and crankiness and they're, they're not happy. And so if we can help them to overcome some of the stress, right? What impact will that have on the thyroid? Yeah. And there are so many other things going on at that time. We have our teenagers and they're leaving school, leaving home. We have empty nest syndrome. We have relationship issues. We have elderly parents who are becoming ill or dying. These all add to the stress of this period of time. We yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When there's elevated, uh, oh, estrogen, elevated testosterone, that can also, and even insulin resistance, these can all happen in the perimenopause. Should we say that again? Stop. Let's go back and not talk over each other. That was me talking over you. <laughs> go back a notch and yeah, we didn't say it again. Okay. So. Another of the things that happens with in the perimenopause is that if there is insulin resistance or elevated estrogen or elevated testosterone, that in itself can depress thyroid binding globulin activity and lead to free T3 and T4 being increased. So it's not all one direction. So you need to be aware uh, and that can cause thyroid resistance as well. Yeah. And our, our practitioners, I mean, most of the people that listen to this podcast are practitioners. We also get those people who are really interested in their own health. But because we, we delve deep into topics here, you know, as practitioners, like we may want to, like we, I've seen this, I've seen people post this on our, on our Facebook group and say, oh, I just had somebody present. And they're usually people are new in the program and they haven't learned all the steps and the processes. It's like, what do I do? What herbs are good for menopause? I'm like, there's all herbs that are good for menopause. There's herbs that are good for people who are experiencing the imbalances of menopause. And then it depends on the individual. So you need a lot more information. We are not, we don't have an, this for that approach. And that's what I love about how you do it. You learned that. That's how you learned in medical school that this for that approach. You have this condition, you prescribe this drug, you, but it doesn't work that way, right? That's not how the human body works. That's not how the hormonal system works. So I think it's, you know, what you're saying is super, super important that we address these things. And the other thing I wanted to go back to, because you mentioned the down regulation of TPO, thyroid peroxidase. And what happens with thyroid peroxidase is if there's an autoimmune condition, there's antibodies attacking it. And thyroid peroxidase is what actually helps us make thyroid hormone, right? It's like, it takes the iodine and the tyrosine and binds them together and makes iodine and makes thyroid hormone. But it, is it, would you say that that downregulation might present as if someone has an autoimmune, even if they don't, because of that downregulation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they may show symptoms of not making sufficient thyroid hormone. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you said too about, oh, there's a delay, Allie. I don't know if you're noticing it, Sam, or are you pressing paw? Uh, okay, might not be a good idea unless you have really noise in the background because it's going to add a lot of edits to this. So, because I'll ask you a question and then I don't realize you've you've heard it or that you're done. And then because you're 
pa there's a pause. So let's see if we can do it without you hitting pause on the or hitting, you know, mute. Or Dr. Rita Marie, after you ask the question, you can wait maybe one, two seconds. Uh, say that again. Um, after you ask your question, yeah. you can wait a couple yeah. of seconds and then Dr. Ali can answer. I can remove those pauses in while I'm editing the audio. Okay. Thank you. That makes it easy. That works. I won't worry okay. about the pool just now. That makes it easier. Okay. But great. Okay. Great. You're worried about the dog barking in the background, right? <laughs> or something like that. Now it's getting like a longer. Okay. Where were we? What should we go back to? Well, I've got, we, we could just carry on. Yeah, I think what we had talked, we, I was asking you, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's very awkward. Um, so I asked you about the thyroid peroxidase and you answered that. And I was going to go back and ask you if, and you're welcome to continue, but what I was going to go back and ask you is, um, what about the, um, uh, oh, what you said, you said about receptors and conversion and thyroid uh, binding globulin. I think those are important points for us to, to, you know, to bring home for people because, you know, if somebody's on estrogen replacement or they're on birth control and their hormones are high, they may have thyroid symptoms. They look like they have thyroid symptoms, but they don't really, it's just an estrogen issue. So take it from there. So we really need to look deeply when someone's showing signs of thyroid issues. It can be due to um, due to uh, the increased thyroid binding globulin. So we know that exogenous estrogens increase sex hormone binding globulin, but because these sex hormones are also carried on thyroid binding globulin to some extent, we also get some increase in thyroid binding globulin. And then you get an inc a reduction in free T3 and T4, which is due to that elevated estrogen. And so if there's a reduction in free T3 and T4, then we're going to have thyroid symptoms without it being a thyroid issue. So these are some of the many different types of thyroid or apparent thyroid dysfunction that we see that most doctors are never, ever taught about. And that's so interesting to me. And that it was fascinating doing the thyroid modules with you in, in your course. Everything that I've learned about it since I use every day in my work. Absolutely. That's awesome. You know, I go back to what did you learn in, in medical school about thyroid? So why don't you share that? Like, well, what did we teach you in medical school that was and, and how limited it was and why we as functional practitioners are expanding that because I love what you said, apparent thyroid problems because the thyroid gland can be perfectly functioning and yet there's thyroid symptoms and a lot of allopathic medical doctors will dismiss that and say, there's nothing wrong with your thyroid. Absolutely. And I've seen it time and time again, people told that there's nothing wrong with their thyroid because only the TSH is being measured. Um, and they are, and, and I've seen this time and time again, this um, gaslighting, if you like, medical gaslighting, where people are being told that there's nothing wrong with them just because the tests that have been done aren't picking it up. Um, and they're not being believed, which is just tragic and something we really need to, uh, we need to combat against. And this is what reinventing healthcare is all about. It's about empowering our patients and letting helping them to, to take back ownership of their health. That's what I'm so passionate about. Um, absolutely. And then another element that comes in is that thyroid dysfunction can itself can also promote estrogen receptors, the alpha proliferative estrogen receptors. So thyroid dysfunction can impact, impact the effectiveness of estrogen and also which receptors are stimulated. So if you get an upregulation of the alpha estrogen receptors, which, you know, if you ask what I get taught at medical school, we get taught, um, and, and, and I was taught 85 to 94. So it was a little while ago and research is always progressing. So we have to be mindful as doctors that even though we're doing 
50 to 100 hours of updates every every year at least there's still a lot that with that where research has moved forward and our knowledge has not but we learned the anatomy we learned the physiology we learned about t3 and t4 and then from there you then go into clinical practice and you're so busy in clinical practice focusing on the breadth of clinical practice that you're focused that you're you're dealing with so as a general practitioner i'm dealing with gynecology and ent and pediatrics um you don't retain you don't retain the parts of that knowledge that that um all of you only retain the parts that you're using every day and we have to simplify yeah. for allopathic medicine and so it becomes if the tsh is high then that's the underactive thyroid and you replace it with t4 and that's all it is you know and, and even with everything i know about free t3 and total t4 and free t4 and reverse t3 i can't request i can't even request free t3 in the uk national health service and um, they will measure a t4 if the tsh is abnormal but if the tsh is normal they won't make it. and only if right yeah 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 only if. yeah and the normal are they using like the conventional norm sorry are they using the conventional normal yes absolutely conventional normal not uh the, not the um not the optimal. functional medicine normal ranges so in functional medicine we're dealing with optimal ranges rather than normal ranges and there are reasons why we have to use normal ranges that are broader in population-based healthcare, like in the UK's National Health Service, because if we tightened up that normal range, we would double the number of people who are perceived as sick, and there just isn't the funding or the staffing to be able to wow. heal that at a population basis. So whereas I'm passionate about the degree of depth that I can go to, because I work both privately in functional medicine and I work in the allopathic national health service with 10 minute appointments, I understand both points of view. And I'm grateful that we have our national mm -hmm. health service in the UK, unlike you in the US uh, and unlike most countries. But I'm also very constantly mindful of the need for people to start to stop handing over their health to the doctor or to the health service which is a disease management mm -hmm. and to take back ownership of their health and take back that responsibility and that's what is what is crucial with this yeah you know, with the perimenopause and the thyroid both can present with depression and mood changes uh, both can present with bowel changes both can represent with hair falling out um and in truth, most people have some dysfunction of both. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it's hard to separate hormones, right? We think, oh, you have a thyroid problem, you have an insulin problem, you have an estrogen problem. But in reality, it's a, it's a system, right? And the system needs to be addressed as a system. And how does the thyroid influence insulin? How does influence in, insulin uh, influence the thyroid? How does the thyroid influence estrogen and testosterone? And and you you mentioned excess estrogen and endogenous ex estrogen can cause the increased thyroid binding globulin, which is effectively low thyroid function. It looks like hypothyroidism, but it's not recognized as a problem. It's like, oh, your TSH is fine, so there's no problem that we should be dealing with. But on the other hand, there's also testosterone, right? Um, testosterone, which does decline it with women in menopause, doesn't it? Yes. Oh, absolutely. And uh, frustratingly, even with a lot of my, uh, of my uh, functional medicine blood tests, when you're doing blood tests, they're their normal ranges for testosterone for postmenopausal women they only give less than such and such amount so you don't get an accurate result just like with progesterone it's it's amazing if you, if you do a, a serum progesterone level they'll only give you as a normal range less than they they'll only give you the result as it being less than such and such so you don't actually know what the level was oh, no. i know how low it is 
and you don't know, you know, you just can't. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, so functional medicine is so exciting in the depth we can go to with the lab tests. At the end of the day, you're treating the human being and you don't need the lab tests. It is possible to improve people's symptoms by just going back to basics, using questionnaires to really analyze in far more depth than we do normally what people's symptoms are, what the antecedents are, what stresses in childhood may be influencing your sleep quality in your 40s and going in depth in the sense of community is important and I'm also an energy healer so I use bioenergetics a lot in my practice as well. All of these things can influence the way someone is feeling in their 40s and 50s and how easily or how difficult their perimenopause and menopause can be. Yeah, and our goal really is to help people to feel well, right? And it's not to address the disease or address the symptoms as much as to help people to rebalance so they don't have those symptoms anymore. And when we do things that just eliminate symptoms, right, we're not getting, um, we're not really helping them to get well. And when we look at the thyroid stuff, the way the thyroid is tested, people are ignored. Like people can go 15 years with a hypothyroid on a cellular level, right? But they're not recognized because the thyroid gland is working. It's the cells and it's the conversion and it's all those other things that are hurting people. And the things that you address with people are the things that help to normalize that. So somebody comes in to you and says, I'm in menopause and I'm miserable and what can you do to help me? They might be expecting, especially in the UK, because it's the way they've been trained, a bioidentical hormone because you're natural, right? But in reality, that's just allopathic medicine. Yeah. It's just allopathic medicine with yeah. a functional medicine slant if you're doing a prescription for bioidentical hormone therapy instead of HRT, or you're doing a prescription for... Um, for Agnes Castis rather than a drug. Instead, we need to be looking at the whole person. Yeah. And we, we need to go to the deeper. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then there's the yeah. other, another element of that complication between thyroid and menopause, of course, is, and another fundamental reason we take a functional medicine and integrative medicine approach is that we want to prevent future ill health. So, of course, women in their 40s and 50s are concerned about heart disease, osteoporosis, and particularly dementia and cancer because these right. are the things that we fear. And under heart disease, I'm including strokes here because that's all cardiovascular disease. It's all to do with the, the, the heart and the blood vessels. But although we know that menopause increases the risk of cardiovascular disease and of osteoporosis. Um, also, low thyroid hormone increases those risks. And we know that when you've got an under thyroid and we've got reduced thyroid function, then we have an abnormal lipid profile, which increases your risk of heart disease and stroke. So that combination of thyroid underactive and menopause increases your future risk of ill health, which is really important. And because it's not here and now, I thought what I'm feeling right now with my hot flashes or my paralyzing anxiety, it's le it, it feels less compelling at the time. And we find this with all preventative health, that it, it's less compelling, uh, uh, but it's nonetheless, it's really important. You know, I agree with you. I think, you know, you and I have had this discussion a number of times that when we um, address symptoms, when, when, when pre symptoms present and we address symptoms, it's already very far along in the disease process that there are imbalances that we can detect and tendencies to those imbalances by looking at diet and lifestyle factors and, and looking at some early markers that we can detect before they have the symptoms, before there's damage to their system, 
so that they can actually get well. And and you're right, preventive medicine is not high on the priority list, especially for a national health system because they're just putting out fires all the time, right? But imagine how many less fires would have to be put out if we address the preventative. Yeah, absolutely. I was feeling more that the, 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 the patients don't feel it's a priority, the preventative medicine side. Um, we put a lot of time and effort in the National Health Service into preventative medicine, and but we don't get the thanks for it because it's in the future and it's intangible. It's not like you just save some mm. life an accident. Um, we may we save far more lives. But anyway, that that is an aside. But another element that I think is really important and undermines women is um, and another element of this medical gaslighting that occurs is the focus on what's called clinical hypothyroidism as opposed to subclinical hypothyroidism. And yeah. the powers that be would have us not do anything for any person who has an underactive thyroid if their TSH is less than 10. Now that's astonishing. And so the 10, the normal route, <sighs> even, even in the allopathic world, the normal range is um, less than 4.5, so 0. 0.5 to, to 4.5. In, uh, in functional medicine terms, we would say we want it less than 2.5. And certainly we find with, um, we were talking about infertility just now before we came on air, but uh, in the fertility work, the, uh, the gynecologists and endocrinologists, when they're working together on infertility, they want to keep people's TSH below 2.5. So we know that that's what's optimal for fertility. If that's what's optimal for fertility, it's gonna be what's optimal for sex hormones as well. However, there's this enormous group of women. And when my thyroid became underactive, it was at, I think my TSH was 19. So it wasn't in this range, but I see women all the time who have a TSH of five or six and the powers that be would have us not, not do anything. Um, of course, in allopathic medicine, all we can do is use T4, which in your world is cystroid or levothyroxine um, rather than addressing the root cause of the thyroid dysfunction uh, along with the perimenopause yeah. dysfunction altogether. But it's really interesting to have this light shone on, on, um, on what's happening in the world. And I, I really want women to stand up for themselves. They need to take back ownership so that they can actually um, say, you know, this is what I, 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 I they, we're so lucky to have the internet and to have this attention to research there. We need to find out for ourselves and improve our thyroid and get that TSH lower. Yeah, absolutely. And um, these are really good points. And the whole prevention thing, um, with when it comes to thyroid, nobody's really looking at prevention. You might be looking at prevention in terms of, you know, diseases of, of infectious origin or, you know, with sanitation and all that. But I think about, you know, prevention when it comes to preventing people from having thyroid issues, preventing people from then having subsequent menopausal issues would be addressing the subclinical hypothyroid, being able to look at that and say, if it looks like a thyroid and it smells like a thyroid and it walks like a thyroid, it's a thyroid problem. It may not be a problem with the gland. It's a problem with the hormones getting to the cells where they have to activate and energize the cells. So we need to change that approach so that people are, are given the opportunity to go, what kind of things? And I want to end with, what do you think are the underlying causes of Thyroid and, and menopausal symptoms, are there a lot of overlap? And, you know, what would that overlap be in the underlying causes of thyroid and, and uh, menopausal symptoms? That's a really interesting question. And I think really it comes back to those fundamentals of functional medicine, whereby we first look at those pillars of, of health. And we're looking at helping people to have a vision for their health first. 
having them understand what's going on with their health as well, getting balance um, and rest and sleep and managing the stress, getting making sure they're having fun every day and activity and action, nourishing their mind, body, and spirit. So nourishing the body with proper foods, not these things that are so-called foods that are in packets and also nourishing the body and toxicity. So toxins are so often a cause for, this is a really big overlap here. Toxins cause thyroid dysfunction, absolutely, because the thyroid gland is so sensitive to toxins of all sorts, such as these alcohol wipes we're supposed to be wiping our hands with, such as the toxins in unfiltered water. But these toxins will also make your PMS worse, they will make your perimenopause worse, they will make your menopause transition worse. So toxins are really important. But toxicity of thoughts as well. And so surround yourself with positive people and try and delete some of those toxic stimuli. And then also moving up the scale, looking at gut health, blood sugar balance and adrenals, because these underpin both thyroid and sex hormones. And they are common ground. If we can get the gut health sorted out, the microbiome sorted out and blood sugar balance sorted out and the adrenals healed at a very deep level, like having high levels of vitamin C to offset the extra work the adrenals are doing when we're stressed like this. This will all stand you in good stead in helping your clients to manage their thyroid and their menopause together. Beautiful, beautiful. I mean, with that, you know, I just want to, you know, really summarize. You've, you've covered so many things, and for those of you who are listening who are health practitioners and m most people are when they listen to us here at reinvent healthcare is that the idea is there's a lot of basic things that we need to do to address imbalances in the body and it overlaps it overlaps the sim the systems the glands and the the cellular integrity that we need to be healthy and so when you're dealing with somebody who presents with menopausal symptoms, don't just jump into, you know, whatever, black cohosh or other kinds of herbs and don't, and Vitex you mentioned earlier for progesterone and bioidenticals because that's just putting a bandaid over the top. The question is why are these things out of balance and how can we get the stress levels, the toxic exposure, the diet, and all those other things in balance. So this has been wonderful. I really appreciate your time and your energy, and I appreciate you being brave enough to step outside the medical model that you were taught. And yeah, there's a lot of doctors who do, but most of them don't, right? They don't want to risk, you know, the, the kinds of the exposure that they get when they don't follow the rules. So thank you. Thank you for being here for, thank you for your dedication to people and, and to people getting well. And for all of you out there listening, right? You have the power to inspire and, and empower and educate people. And education is so critical um, about how their bodies work and about how their habits and their choices every day make a difference in how their health is manifesting. So use the power of nutrition and lifestyle to help people optimize. Don't ever forget those basics as you might look for the, the magic herb or the magic bioidentical or whatever. We've got to help people to make better choices. Yeah, it's not just that, right? But it's way more important than is giving credit in the Western medicine. So hopefully by using this information, you can help prevent people from suffering with thyroid issues, which may lead to menopausal symptoms, which may lead to osteoporosis and uh, cardiac disease, strokes, et cetera. And you can help them by applying these principles. So we put together a free guide um, to thyroid health that includes a list of lab tests and optimal ranges, um, nutrients that are important for thyroid, some of the medications and toxins that can impact. So if you go to reinventhealthcare.com forward slash thyroid, you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to get that. And I will give all your, all the links to Dr. Allie so you can connect with her and they'll be on the show notes page. And I just recommend that you study and learn and always be a resource for people. Always give them 
access to information and tools that they need to take charge of their health. I love how Dr. Ali talked about take ownership of your body, of your health, because that's what's great. So if any of you want to go deeper into this methodology and nutritional endocrinology, just go to inemethod.com and uh, check out what we have there. And until next time, shine on.